The last few topics in energy I consider to be somewhat more advanced topics, especially this first one. We have functionally two more topics. The first one is a bit lengthy, and that's the comparing the force on an object to the energy of that object, the relationship between force and energy. And that's both mathematical and graphical. We can both do the math on that and we can graph what's going on. The last thing we'll talk about is just power, which is energy per time. So let's start with force and energy and the relationship between them. Here's an equation that we can start out with. The force in the x direction as a function of x, so this right here is saying we're looking at a particular case where the force in a particular direction might change depending on where you are in that direction. So the force in the direction of x might change depending on where you are on the x-axis. It doesn't necessarily have to change, but this allows for it to change as you move. Well, that force is equal to the negative of the derivative of u. We've been using u as the potential energy of an object. We only have two potential energies, and we're really going to stick with those two potential energies, at least mathematically. But those two energies are gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy. Both of them have a u. There's ug and us for gravitational and spring. This is saying that if you take the derivative of the potential energy, whichever one you're looking at, take the derivative of that with respect to x, with respect to some direction, some displacement, and then you make it negative, that's going to give you the force that's associated with that potential. Now, both potentials that we've discussed have a force associated with them. We have gravitational potential energy. Obviously, the force associated with that is gravity. We've got spring potential energy, and the, um, the force associated with spring potential is the spring force. Hooke's law is what it's called. That's going to be very handy for us as we start graphing things and talking about the meanings of those graphs. This derivative is actually very similar to a variant of work, which we very briefly discussed and then moved on from. That The work is equal to the integral from some point, point one, to some point, point two, integral from, those po from one point to another point of the force dotted with the distance that we're going, dl. This is the derivative form of this work equation right there. Very, very similar. The force in x is equal to negative du dx. OK, great. Let's try it for each of the things that we've already, already got. We've got the spring potential being a 1 half kx squared. Well, we can plug in whatever potential we want in here for u. So I'm just going to plug in 1 half kx squared in for u of x. The derivative of 1 half kx squared, well, the squared is going to come down. And so it's going to be 2 over 2 or just 1. And then we've just got kx. So the derivative of us, the derivative of the spring potential, is just kx. But then we need to remember that negative. And we get negative kx right there. Oh, but negative kx is exactly Hooke's law. That's the law that governs springs, the force of springs. So we've got it right there. We've got the force of a spring is equal to negative kx right there just by taking that derivative. That's exactly what we expected to find. What about the gravitational potential energy? Well, let's plug in mgy in here, negative du over, instead of dx, we're going to call it dy. You see down here that I changed it from x's to y's. It works just as well. Uh, we, we've talked about how we can switch x's and y's as necessary 
in, in any kind of problem as long as it works conceptually. And so the negative of the derivative of mgy with respect to y, well, that just makes the y go away. And we need to remember that negative sign, so we get negative mg. Hey, that's the force due to gravity. It even gets the right direction because we have the gravity pointing down. We've got that the force of gravity as a function of your height actually doesn't matter. Your height doesn't matter with gravity until that's, that's true now, but it's not going to always be true because we're going to talk about things in orbit up in space. And then the force of gravity does change once you're sufficiently far from the center of the Earth. But you're going to, near the surface of the Earth, just get negative mg. The force of gravity is m times g, and it points down, given that negative sign. So that's kind of neat. What have we learned? The derivative of the potential energy is related to the force. It's not exactly the force, but it's, it's related to the force in some way. So whenever we have two quantities that are related to each other, we can graph them. You know, we've been doing that. We've been talking about how velocity might be related to time. And if you're accelerating, then your velocity changes with time. And so you can graph velocity versus time on a, on a graph. And then the slope of that is your acceleration, just like graphing position versus time. Take the derivative of that, you get the velocity. You the slope is the velocity. We can do something very similar here. We can graph the energy and the force or the distance, or well, we'll have to decide exactly what we're going to, uh, to graph. If we graph the energy versus the position. Now, let's look back at this. This is the slope of the energy versus the position. This derivative indicates the energy over the position. So the slope of this, of the energy position graph, is going to get you the force. That is the clue that we need to figure out how we're going to graph these things. We can make something called a potential energy graph. And that is the potential energy, whatever U is, versus the position on the x-axis. So we'll have the potential energy on the y-axis and the position on the x-axis. And the slope of that, technically the negative of the slope of that, is going to be the force on some object with that kind of potential energy. This will make more sense when we actually start looking at examples. We can also define a quantity called total mechanical energy. Well, we already have actually. I'm just putting this in to remind you that the total mechanical energy is equal to the kinetic energy of an object plus the potential energy of that object. The total mechanical energy should be conserved unless there's outside stuff happening. This is the whole work other is equal to delta E, but the delta E was just like all the mechanical energy in the object, which is all the different kinds of kinetic energy. We've only discussed one, just regular linear. We will discuss rotational. And then potential energy, and we've discussed two, and it's gravitational potential and spring potential. So, Unless there's outside forces doing work on the system that we have not already discussed, then the total mechanical energy has to remain constant. And for this stuff, there won't be outside forces. For the next while, we're going to keep the total mechanical energy perfectly conserved. We will not change the total mechanical energy on any of these unless, well, Actually, that's not even true. I could always say, hey, we add three more joules to this thing and let's see what else happens. So I, I will be very clear if we're changing the total mechanical energy. Let me say that. But changing the total mechanical energy will change the kinetic and potential energy. Let's look at this spring, this mass on the spring. Let's leave the mass there at the beginning. We've got a, a spring attached to this mass somewhere. And we can take this mass and we can stretch the spring and pull the mass all the way over to the right. If we've pulled 
the mass all the way over to the right with the spring still attached, then we've put a whole bunch of energy into that spring. That spring will have a bunch of energy in it, a potential spring energy due to it being stretched out. You can add energy to a spring by stretching it out or compressing it. So now we've given the spring potential energy. We can then release the mass. We can let go of the mass. It's going to start moving to the left. It'll start moving to the left and it's going to start gaining kinetic energy as it does so. It's going to speed up going to the left. The spring is wanting to compress. Not really compress, it's wanting to get back to its normal length. And so the, the mass is going to start wanting to go to the left and it's going to speed up. And so it gains kinetic energy. But as it does so, the spring is getting shorter. And when it gets shorter, when it gets closer to its equilibrium length, then it's going to be losing its spring potential energy. When it gets back to normal length, it should have no spring potential energy because there's no spring potential in a spring that's just sitting there. And so in effect, what's happening is the system is exchanging the spring potential energy for kinetic energy. We're building up kinetic energy and reducing spring potential energy. Now, this goes right back to this equation, that the total mechanical energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. As we lose potential spring energy, we gain kinetic energy, and our total mechanical energy stays the exact same value. Okay, eventually, the mass will get to the midpoint. And at the midpoint, the spring is neither stretched nor compressed. And so the spring has no potential energy anymore. At that point, all of the energy is in kinetic energy. And it's still wanting to go to the left. And so the spring starts getting compressed instead. It's got leftward kinetic energy. Of course, kinetic energy has no direction, but it has kinetic energy and it's moving to the left. And so it starts compressing the spring. And okay, eventually it compresses the spring quite a bit, but it has slowed down and even stopped. It's exchanged all that kinetic energy back into spring potential energy. When it's over here at negative A, all the way to the left, then the spring has been compressed quite a bit. The spring is storing a huge amount of energy, but the block has stopped. It changed all of its kinetic energy back into spring energy. So you pull it all the way over here, it all starts out as spring energy, and then here at O, it's all kinetic energy, and then there at negative A, it's all spring energy again. And so then, once it's all the way over here, the spring wants to push it back out. Once it's over at negative A, then the spring is like, well, I don't want you here. So the spring pushes it back towards the center. And so it gives up its spring potential in favor of kinetic going to the right. And the whole process just goes back and forth. If you take this mass and you stretch it all the way over here and let it go, and if everything is perfectly efficient and perfectly frictionless, then the mass should just oscillate back and forth and back and forth forever. In the middle, it's going the fastest because the spring is not compressed anymore. And to the sides, it's going the slowest. It stops on the sides and all the energy is in the spring. But if you add up all the energy at the sides, which is just spring energy, and you compare that to all the energy in the middle, which is just kinetic energy, you should find that the energy, the total mechanical energy is the same at all points. It just changes form from spring potential at negative A and A to kinetic at O. We can graph this. And I really don't actually like this graph here. This graph has way too much stuff on it. And so what I'm gonna do is graph it myself. We have a graph of potential spring energy versus position. We're given an equation when it comes to springs that us is equal to one half k x squared. Well, let's graph this. We can do that. This is just an equation. It's like saying y is equal to something something x. 
And so we can graph 1 half kx squared. It's a parabola, something like that. 1 half kx squared, like that. This right here is our equilibrium point, which is called O on the previous diagram. And, you know, if we just have this, this isn't really telling us. We have to determine how much energy something has. Maybe it has no energy. Maybe there's no energy here. And so we just draw a line all the way down there at zero because there's no energy in the system. This is how much energy there is. The y-axis is how much energy there is. Well, maybe there is some energy. And so we draw a line here saying that the, there's some total mechanical energy. Any kind of line that you have to draw on a plot like this that goes directly across, that's going to be measuring your total mechanical energy, which usually we just call E for simplicity. So this is my total energy of the system. This would mean that I took the, the, um, the cart, the mass, and I stretched, I pulled it out, I stretched the spring until it was at this position. That position is A. This position is negative A. If I have stretched the spring out so that the mass is at positive A, then let's just look at this little section right there. If I have stretched it out and I'm holding on to it, then all of my energy is spring potential. As we discussed on that slide, when I have stretched, it, stretched out the spring and put the mass at A, all of the energy is spring energy. Well, this line shows us what the spring energy is. And so when we're at this point, well, the amount of spring energy we have, this is just reading a normal graph. At this point, we're just reading a normal graph. If I told you to read this graph and tell me what the amount of, uh, of a potential energy was at point A, you just look at this graph and you'd say, oh, well, it's that. You know, even ignoring all the other lines and dotted lines and everything on here, then if I just said, find the potential energy at point A, you'd be like, oh, well, it's that because that's where the line is above point A. It's just regular reading a graph, nothing weird about that. Well, then I let go and say it's, it's here at that point. Well, you would tell me, oh, well, obviously the amount of spring potential energy is just this. That's the amount of spring potential energy. Whatever this is, E, that E, I'll call it E2, I'll call this uh, E1, just to have a name for it. You'd just say, oh yeah, it's got E2 amount of, of spring potential at that point. So you'd say, well, this amount in there, that's the amount of spring potential. Obviously, because that's what the graph says. Okay, well, what about uh, the kinetic energy? Do we know how much kinetic energy is in this now? Well, yeah, we do. We said that the total mechanical energy must be conserved. And so, the, and the total mechanical energy is equal to the, uh, the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. So if we have this much potential energy, we need to add a certain amount of kinetic energy. And when we add the right amount of kinetic energy, then U plus KE will go back to equaling this. Well, that's just gonna be this amount. Whatever this is, that's the kinetic energy. Whatever is above the line until you get to whatever limit you've got, you get to the total mechanical energy. Whatever is above the line, that's going to be the kinetic energy. Whatever is below the line, that's going to be the potential energy. We can look here at the origin. Now, what did we say at the origin at O? We had no potential energy. The potential energy was zero there because the spring is just very happy to be its normal length. And so we see, oh yeah, there's definitely no spring potential at that point. According to this graph, there's no spring potential. But we know that if we have this much energy, then all of this has to be the kinetic energy. All of this is kinetic energy right there.
we go past that line and we say, oh, when we are there, for example, then this amount, that's going to be how much spring potential we have. And this amount will be how much kinetic energy we have. So again, U and Ke. And then here, all the way at negative A, that's where it stops and turns around. Well, all this is spring, and none of it is kinetic because it stops and turns around. There's a lot of stuff here, as you can see. This is not a simple diagram. And so I encourage you to go back and study this and read what it says in the book about it, because the book also tries to go over this in great detail. This is an extremely convenient way of looking at potential energy and looking at position and even forces. Let's look at this again. I'm going to simplify it. Mostly, I'm just going to draw it again so that there's not a lot of stuff on it. There we are. There's our us is equal to 1 half kx squared. And we know that the force in x as a function of x is going to equal negative du x dx. And the force of a spring, according to this, is negative kx, as we established before. Well, let's look at a. There's a. The force at a, well, we draw the slope. There's the slope. So it's got, yeah, it's got quite a bit of force. That slope is pretty steep. Therefore, it's quite a bit of force. Okay, well, um, because that's the slope right there, remember, that's the slope, quite a bit of force, but which direction is that force pointing? Well, it's pointing in the opposite direction. This is a very positive slope. Therefore, the force must be very negative. When you're here at positive A, the spring wants to pull you back, which is exactly what you'd expect from a large positive slope, large positive slope, you then take the negative of, that says, oh, well, the thing actually wants to go back that way. The, the actual force is the negative of the slope. So if the slope is large and positive, then with that negative sign, you're going to have a large negative force. Here, where the spring has no um, uh, change in its equilibrium length, the, the, the length of the spring is equal to the equilibrium length, Right there, you've got a slope of zero, no slope at all. And so you've got no force there. There's no force in either direction there. Well, when the length is zero, when the change from equilibrium length is zero, you've got no force of the spring, exactly as you'd expect. Over here at negative A, at that point, you draw the slope, it is a large negative slope, like that, significant negative slope. Negative of a negative is positive. The spring wants to go in the positive direction, positive direction, because it goes from a large negative slope and then we have to apply that negative sign right there. You can, if you can draw a graph of the, of the potential of any force, you draw that you just find the potential of something, the potential energy of something, you draw that, you can figure out what the forces are going to be at any point on that. And I think that's really neat. Here you see that diagram all again, but again, the video might be better because you can see as I'm drawing it. This is exactly what I said. Over, over here on the left, it's exactly what I just said. We can use this to make the energy position diagrams, as I said. Put energy on the y-axis, position on the x-axis. The curve is the potential energy. Gravitational or spring is what we've done so far, talking about potential energy. And you just read it like any other graph. At some point x, it has y potential energy. And 
at any point, at every point, it has some total energy which does not change with position. We can manually change it by saying, oh yeah, and then I add three joules, whatever it is. But it's not going to change, uh, it's, the total mechanical energy will not change as things move back and forth. So we have the total mechanical energy, often abbreviated with E, is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The potential energy is whatever is below the potential energy curve, and the kinetic energy is whatever is above the potential energy curve. So we draw a horizontal line to find that total energy, and, um, and we use that whatever's between the potential energy and that total energy that's kinetic, whatever is between the potential energy line and the x-axis is going to be potential. And objects will go back and forth oscillating between those two points. We see with this here that the block oscillates between A and negative A. Here, the line, the total mechanical energy line, intersects the potential energy line at negative A and A. The block does not move beyond negative A or beyond A, because if it did, it would have to have a negative kinetic energy. It would have, it would have more potential energy than total energy, and therefore the kinetic would be negative, but that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that is not what happens. It has to just stop at that point and turn around. You can't have negative kinetic energy. There's some very confusing diagrams in the book. And the reason that they're confusing is that they have all this information on them all at once. So I'm going to do what I just did again. I'm going to redraw these diagrams that the book gives you, but I'm going to go over every single step in them as we go through them. And hopefully that'll help you understand it better. We've got a roller coaster. And the roller coaster does that kind of thing. Well, let's say that we have a certain amount of energy total. I don't know what that is yet. Uh, let's deal with that later. Let's just think about what would happen if I had a roller coaster cart right there. Let's say I had a roller coaster cart at zero speed right there. Here we have a roller coaster cart on this roller coaster. And I think that we all know that if we have a roller coaster like that, and you can always think about potential energy diagrams as just being roller coasters. If you've got a roller coaster like this, you know which way the cart is going to move. The cart is going to move that way. If you're there on a roller coaster and you have zero speed, the cart will move that way. Let's make a diagram of the, uh, oh, actually I need to make it like this. This is gonna be the force as a function of X. Well, when you're in this kind of range, in this first range, you know that no matter where you are in this first range, that the force is always going to be the right. Whether you're up here, it's gonna be just barely to the right. If you're down here, it'll be barely to the right. If you're here, it'll be a whole lot to the right. That's how the force is going to be on this side. Here, it's going to be a whole bunch to the right. Here and here, it won't be very much to the right, but it'll still be a little bit to the right. That's just how roller coasters work. Let's think about this in terms of derivatives and slopes. Here, the slope is a little bit negative. There, it's a little bit negative. There, it's a whole bunch negative. But remember that the force is equal to the negative of the derivative of the potential. So if it's a little bit negative there and a little bit negative there and a lot negative there, the force is going to have a little force, a little positive, a little positive, and very positive. So the force diagram actually looks something like that. If you take the derivative of each point, 
here and plot that derivative here, it looks something like that. You can do that again here in this next region. I'm drawing these region lines going right through a place where the, the slope is zero. If you can notice that, see there, the slope is zero. And there, the slope is zero. And so I just draw those lines to those places for convenience. You have the same kind of thing here that over at this point, you've got a small positive slope, large positive slope, small positive slope. Well, we have to remember that negative sign and we take the slopes and turn them into to the positions here, the forces. And so a small positive slope becomes a small negative value for the force, which gets very negative and then a little bit negative. And you see that at these points, at that point right there, so if the cart was there in that valley or there on that hill, at that valley, you shouldn't have any force on your, you, like your, the, there should be no forces wanting to change the position of your, of your cart right there. And so we have the force. The force here at this point is zero. There's zero force at that point, exactly what we would expect. At this point, you're at the top of the hill. And okay, yeah, if a slight breeze hit you, then you'd fall to one side or the other. But without any slight breezes, then you'd have no force that's wanting to change your position up there. And we see down there, again, no force. We can do this for all the remaining regions, oh, something like that. And we can say, okay, we've got slightly negative, more negative, slightly negative. So it'd be something like this. And then we've got positive. We need to remember those negative signs. And so it'd be something like that. And then at some point, we just get to zero force. Here, the slope is zero. And so negative of zero is still zero. So this is a diagram of the forces that would be acting on a roller coaster cart in this kind of potential, like that. That right there. This is how we can use potential and force and relate between them. This is very important in chemistry in particular because there are chemical uh, energies, chemical potential energies that will change depending on the position of two, of two atoms. As two atoms get closer to each other or farther apart from each other, the force between them will change and the potential energy between them will change. And understanding the potential energies and the forces between atoms will tell us which uh, molecules will release energy when they're combined, which, one, which ones take energy to combine, and vice versa. There are also these equilibrium points on a energy versus position graph. Now, if you think about this as a roller coaster, which is the easiest way to think about this, then at the bottoms of these hills, if you just put a, a roller coaster cart down at the bottom of the hill, it would just not move. You know, if you, just imagine this as a roller coaster and putting a cart at the bottom of a hill. If it had no kinetic energy, it's just going to stay there forever. And so that's stable, called a stable equilibrium. However, if you put your roller coaster cart at the top of a hill, and if there's no breezes, there's nothing touching that cart to you know, change its forces even a little bit, then it should stay there. It should stay at the tops of those hills. However, the slightest little force or the slightest deviation from the very exact top of a hill will cause it to fall down into the other hill, into the other valley somewhere. And so that's called unstable equilibrium. There's also something called nu neutral equilibrium, and that's just flat. If you ever have a flat piece of, uh, of track or a flat part of your potential versus uh, position diagram, then that's neutral equilibrium. Because if, so, if a cart is just on a very flat part, then, uh, then it shouldn't move unless someone is trying to move it. 